So last week, if you were here or you watched online, you know we explored the idea of becoming the observer of ourselves and our thoughts. And we called it witness consciousness because that's one of the terms that it is known as. But I felt like one of the things we haven't really talked about at all this year is the images that we hold in our consciousness. So knowing that we've talked about our thoughts, we're moving into images now today. And I want to begin with a story that I think fit perfectly for today's message. A preacher started out his sermon by asking everyone to close their eyes. He said, picture a used car salesman, picture a librarian, picture a sumo wrestler. And then he said, picture a spiritual person. He went on to ask his congregation, what did you see when you pictured a used car salesman, a librarian, and the sumo wrestler? And each time he asked the questions, these stereotypes were described in the images. Then he asked, what does a spiritual person look like? And he asked, how many of you pictured somebody like Mother Teresa? Lots of hands went up. But then he said, how many of you pictured yourself when I asked you to think about a spiritual person? Now, imagination is one of our 12 powers in unity. And it allows us to create images in our mind or what we know it as, as our mind's eye. The image of every single idea that exists in this world started in someone's image. Everything that exists in this world started with an image, an idea, before it was ever thought. Someone saw it, and then they thought about it, and then they act on it. The power of imagination allows us to visualize what is not right in front of us and what can help us develop a higher consciousness. And in turn, we will grow spiritually. So if we can imagine something and keep the image held in consciousness and manifest it, then we have a much better chance of developing our spiritual self because images held in mind produce after their own kind, just like thoughts. So if you're always holding negative images, you are producing negative outcomes. They go hand in hand. All day, even in our sleep, we have images passing through the canvas of our mind's eye. We dream. And sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not because those images we hold do not always work in our favor. Charles Fillmore, the founder, co-founder of Unity, taught us to pay attention to our dreams and inner urgings and to see them as God's way of communicating to us. But he also reminded us that our imagination gets used for good and for evil. Charles uses the analogy of the old style silent movies so where people had no sound, so the viewer actually had to imagine what was going on. And he said that no two people ever walked away from a silent movie with the same story because they imagined from what they were seeing, they were able to imagine it with their own perspective. But he said, in the same way that our imagination projects images that are not uh, fully a capable of expressing themselves, our conscious mind has to then interpret whatever images are going on. So these images are being built, and then our active mind is saying, okay, let's do it, even when it isn't working for us. 
Charles said, we bring into manifestation that which our eyes cannot see. But if we had enough faith to hold on to the pictures, we would see them manifest themselves. Now, just out of curiosity, how many of us have had amazing dreams or incredible images that we really wanted to accomplish, but then talked ourselves out of them? Oh, this is too big. Oh, I don't have a bank account to support that. Oh, this is impossible for me. Look where I've been. Look what I'm going through. How many times do we do that self-sabotaging? Because we cannot hold with faith the images that we actually want to manifest. Reverend Kathy Beasley reminds us that our capacity to embrace possibility is linked to our ability to imagine something other than what is in front of us. That is the hardest thing I think we do as humans. Here's my circumstances, but here's what I'm going to imagine regardless. Every time we do that, we're drawn into the, yeah, but that's not real. That's not real. That can't happen for you. You've never done that in the past. But I really feel mo many of us have stories and are living proof of what we've been able to accomplish. How many of us have done things that people said we would never do because we held the image for ourselves? In the book Living Untethered, you know, one of my favorite, Michael Singer helps us further understand this because he explains that our mind's eye captures and recalls the images, but at the same time, it acts as an emotional amplifier. So these images now can either bring us happiness or they will cause us pain because our emotions are amplified in the process. Our mind's eye interprets and creates our experiences, he says, by reinforcing or strengthening feelings that are produced from our experiences. And he says we do one of two things when these images are projected. We cling to the images we cherish, holding every image exactly as it was, wanting it to be exactly as it was, or we resist the images because we feel uncomfortable. Now, I want to explain this so that we can actually use this. Clinging, let's talk about clinging first. Clinging is not the same as remembering or recalling. It's okay to remember. It's okay to recall. Clinging is when we cling to a beautiful memory to the point of nothing else ever being able to live up to that, that um, memory. So for example, if you enjoyed an incredible trip that you're still clinging to in a way that no vacation since has lived up to your expectations, the food, the people, the experience, nothing compares to what that image is. Well, if we continue to do that with every image that we hold dear, then guess what? We will spend the rest of our life disappointed in every vacation. The same is true for relationships, the same is true for anything. Keep clinging to the past and not letting it just be a recalled memory, and you will find that you can not move on. You are stuck. And most of us can say we've been there before. When we cling to even our good memories, we prevent ourselves from being able to experience what is happening in front of us in the moment. And the important thing to understand is that clinging creates blockages. It blocks our energy. Now, the second option he talked about was resisting. Think of an event that you attended when you enjoyed yourself until someone you don't like walked in the door. 
Now just think it, we've, we've had those memories. You're having a great time and there they are, okay? In this situation, we might resist what's uncomfortable, but rather than let that old image just pass through, we just hold on to it. Equally important to mention is that every time then that you see this person, that image appears in your mind because you never let it go. And now there's another blockage of energy because now you're going to add the party to it. So we just continue to stop ourselves from moving forward because we're stuck on the old stories, which we talked about before our thoughts. Then we're stuck on holding on to those thoughts and we regurgitate them to the point of nausea. And now we hold images that won't allow us to see ourselves in a better place. And when all of those things happen, it's a lose-lose uh, situation for us. We lose when we can't experience what we jo enjoyed in the past, and we lose when something reminds us of what bothered us in the past. There's no moving forward. Michael Singer explains that our blocked energy is like having a computer virus that distorts the consciousness and the subconsciousness and causes us to do all kinds of crazy things like avoid people and compare relationships and experiences, anticipate challenges and even worry about them when no challenge exists at the time, ruin our current and present moment experiences based upon expectations for outcomes. I was waiting for that one thing, but it never happened. Now I'm disappointed, so I couldn't enjoy the moment. These blockages prevent us from experiencing our best life because we as humans do not let anything go. And we have to be able to do that if we're going to hold the right images. What if I told you that our suffer suffering is caused by the contrast between what we imagine things should be and the reality that's actually happening? Because it's true, we are self-sabotagers in that way. And we are always the cause. If we didn't have any expectations, we'd never be disappointed. And if we held on to the images long enough, we'd be able to talk about the manifestation of those things in our lives. I could spend an entire week talking about that in my own life. I could spend a week talking about it. I've written for years about it. Changing my mind, changing those images, not being stuck. Think about a family reunion or a wedding or even a first date with someone. The whole time you're getting ready, you're imagining the scenes. Oh, I can't wait. I'm looking forward to seeing so-and-so. And it'll be such a great opportunity. And you're all dressed up and you're ready and you get there and so-and-so didn't show up. They're not attending. So you spent the whole time thinking about, oh, I'm so disappointed. That was the main reason I came. Okay, now 10 people have said hello to you. Oh, hi. Hi. Oh, hi. Good to see you. Still, still regurgitating, regurgitating. Okay, the problem with that is we already created images of what the experience should be like. But when we do that, what is the likelihood of any experience being one of enjoyment? If we've already got it all mapped out, you think you're going to go and enjoy yourself. If it isn't the way you pictured it, how many divorces happen in the world? All of us who have been through it, how many of us can say it didn't look like what we thought it was going to look like? Right? Okay, I'm just saying it affects us in so many ways. How do we spend 
three decades or two decades or five decades with one human being and not imagine it being changing, ongoing, different. We're all growing. Reverend Sharon Connors says we need to see our heart's desire, feel it, pray it, and seek guidance while trusting God and this mighty universe. She said, reflect on the dearest dreams of our hearts by holding visions that excite our heart. Remember that our imagination is our capacity to form pictures in our mind's eye, the architect and builder of our dreams, the scissors of the mind, our invisible paintbrush, the palette of colors for our canvas. For better or worse, our imagination generates the living pictures of our thoughts. And we need to choose with exquisite care and attention, she says, the pictures that occupy the canvas of our mind. Pictures held in mind with matching emotions in our heart will create after their own kind. Mixed messages from mind and heart produce mixed results and are truly negative po potions. But my favorite line from her, and I'm going to read this verbatim, imagination in concert with your faith shapes substances. It clothes, clothes your thought with form and color. What you see affects how you are and what you do. To catch God's vision for our lives, we need to divinize our imagination by refusing to allow fierce, self-limiting thoughts or painful memories to be the films that we continue to project on the screen of our minds. And I'll just say that with all that's going on in the world, I think it's time we take control of the images and control what images we allow in. We're choosing to suffer by all the things we're looking at and all the things that we are creating in our minds. And as Michael Singer said, the truth is, life doesn't hit you in your weak spots. You project your weak spots on life. Now that's something for us to think about. I think we deserve better. And I wish two things for us. One is that we learn to imagine our, a life that brings us our heart's desires and that we practice diligence in holding those images until they become a reality. Let's review our takeaways. So imagining with our mind's eye can change our lives if we understand the following, that first, every idea begins first in divine mind. This is the power to create our desires. Number two, possibilities require mental imagery. Images can work for or against us. Number three, stored blockages prevent growth. We must learn to release them. And number four, images and emotions and faith equal substance. See it, feel it, trust it, and be open to receiving it. The affirmation I wrote for us today is, I am imagining my best life. Let's say that together and mean it. I am imagining my best life. I encourage you to say that every day to yourself, as long as it takes. And I'll end with a quote from Charles, to allow the imagination to drift in daydreams never brings anything to pass. Ideas must be worked up into being, breathing, thinking things. Let's reflect on that for a moment. So we give thanks for the power of imagination, the ability to imagine everything that we desire and to let go of fears and limiting thoughts and the feeling that we are being held hostage by our circumstances. We free to think and believe what we need to but if we don't imagine it nothing 
can happen. And so we say thank you, God, for the power of imagination which lives within each of us. And so it is. Amen.